March 26, 2012, meeting of the East Washington <coughs> School District Board of School Directors will please hereby come to order. Please rise and find me in saluting the flag. My pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight I have uh, one request to address the board from Ms. Jennifer Taylor of West Coastville. I uh, give you a letter so that you can uh, see the visuals that go with it. Uh, my name is Jennifer Taylor and I have a son in the first grade at Seven Generations Charter School and another son starting kindergarten in the fall. I'm not a founding member of the school uh, and my son is entered through Seven Gen through the lottery and the waiting list process. A couple weeks ago, I shared Andrew's experience with the social and emotional curriculum at 7th Gen. Tonight, I would like to share our experience with the academic curriculum. Having attended Pennsylvania Public Schools for 13, 11 of my 13 years, I thought I had a good idea of what school would be like for my son. Fortunately for him, a lot of things have changed since the 1970s. The first thing I noticed was I saw uh, a lot of crossover between subjects. On his very first day of kindergarten at 7th Gen in late November 2010, the class walked to the Emmaus Yardway Center for EIC to learn about composition, systems, and cycles, science. Then they returned to the classroom to draw pictures of each phase that they saw, part. Later, projects built on the same idea, and they used sight words or wrote sentences about what was happening in each phase, literacy. Similar days laid ahead for Andrew with hikes in and around the school and Emmaus. To me, this was an amazing way to bring together academics and their surroundings while keeping the kids connected to their community. This was it. This is what Southern Gen had promised us, and they had delivered. Then came math. This year I was prepared for basic arithmetic that first graders do and tears at the kitchen table during homework time. But along came number bonds, among other things I had never heard of. Not having the unspoiled mind of a six-year-old, I just did not get it. Andrew's math teacher pointed me to some online resources so that I could relearn how to learn, and the light bulb went off. I realized they were teaching Andrew how to break down problems, how to reuse concepts, how to think. Our bedtime activities included reading stories as well as number bonds and number sentences. Andrew was excited to just do math and share that excitement with his little brother. It was weird, another score from the Southern Gen curriculum. Then came homework. Again, I was bracing for the tears. The teachers asked we read nightly, and a homework packet is sent home once a week. As a family, we can decide what nights homework fits into our schedule with work commitments, after-school activities, and neighborhood playtime. This not only allows Andrew shorter and repetitive exposure to his classwork, but it teaches Andrew time management and the power of procrastination, an unexpected benefit of the 7th Gen curriculum. Then came what we called Field Trip Week 2011 last December, a whole new way to see how the school community reacts to obstacles that crop up in life. The curriculum took on new life that week as parents shared creative child care and field trip ideas during the days when school is closed and when school is back in session, the board and staff organized academic days at the Lehigh Valley Zoo, Da Vinci Science Center, and Rodale Aquatic Center. Seven Den Gen does not just take lemons and make lemonade, we make lemon meringue pie and slice it up talk about fractions. Andrew's teachers these first two years have done something really interesting. They've taken books and their own ideas to create a curriculum that teaches not only the basics, but also flip the switch inside Andrew to keep him coming back for more. What else could a parent in the local public school ask for? Thank you, Ms. Taylor, and for your uh, written remarks. Having no other requests to address the board, I will move on to item three, approval of minutes. Can I have a motion, please? Well, no. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? None appearing. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, motion carries, the minutes are approved. Um, I don't have it here on my uh, agenda, but we do have representatives from student government here our student members of the board. Uh, so I would uh, ask you at this time to uh, make your report, if you would, please. 
Recently, um, student government had its first ever Mr. Emmaus tournament or competition where the senior boys <coughs> compete in a um, variety of events such as formal wear, casual wear, and talent and interview. And uh, the first winner was Tyler Banky. Also, the juniors took their March PSSAs and will continue their April testing on the 16th, 17th, 23rd, and 24th. Power, Power Emmaus High School alumni Corey Jones, class of 2007, has become a successful actor in film and television. He is so thankful for the opportunities Emmaus High School offered him. The drama department of EHS had prepared for him uh, had prepared him for where he is today. We'd like to congratulate LCTI Academic Center students who were part of the Skills USA District competition. Kenesha Grant and Caitlin Benikoff placed first, and Benjamin Hull and Brandy O'Brien placed third. There were 11 EHS students that have been qualified for the National Merit Semifinalists. These students have met all the requirements are advancing to the finalists. Congrats to Jessica Ackerman, Brian Alville, Lydia Brew, Brittany Gilbert, Jason Grayville, Michelle Lanchi, Angela Sini, Swan Mao, Parthik Naradai, Madeline Smith, and Emily Webb. On February 2nd, the Department of Athletics held the National Letter of Intense Signing. These students have worked hard and will continue their athletics in college, in either field hockey, soccer, swimming, basketball, or football. On Tuesday, January 17th, 7th, the girls' basketball held their mentor night, and on the 20th, the boys had theirs. Our <coughs> senior ball will be held on April 28th at the Palace Center with the theme of Island Paradise. Uh, the Class of 2012 After Ball Party will also be held at EHS, and the Junior Prom will take place on Saturday, May 5th in the EHS CAF. The Alliance for Young Artists and writers sponsor the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards every year. Almost 100,000 students submit their work to be reviewed by judges, but EHS art teachers choose the students who submit their work on the regional level. These students were judged off of many types of different arts, such as ceramic work, mixed media pieces, paintings, drawings, and more. Congrat congratulations to those students who received gold keys, silver keys, and honorable mention. Also, congratulations to the students from Emmaus High School who were selected to participate in the Pennsylvania Music Educators Association District 10 Chorus Festival. For the fifth year in a row, Emmaus had the most singers who qualified out of 700 students from 65 participating high schools. We had 19 seniors chosen, chosen along with 16 juniors, 6 sophomores, and 1 freshman. History Day was held at Emmaus on Friday, January 6th. Our first and second place winners move on to the regional competition that was held on March 3rd. Uh, lastly, our most important, important information we have to share is this past month, the Hallowed uh, Hornet Award went out to Catherine Washer and Jason Geis. The Hallowed Hornet Award is something that faculty and staff members do to um, nominate colleagues who they think contribute to a positive and successful school environment. That's all. Okay. Are there any questions for our student representatives? If not, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay for the fun and games. Or you can go back to something more interesting like your homework. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate those reports. We'd like to hear what our students are doing and all the great things our East Penn community is doing in high school. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion about our community. No problem. Right. We always welcome your reports. Uh, the next item is the uh, report of the superintendent of schools, Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Uh, a couple of nice things are going on in the district. Uh, I heard from um, Connie Arnold, who directs our orchestra program. And I, I think this is a really special thing that she and the high school students are going to do. They're going to uh, commission a music composer uh, to do a piece in honor of Ben Alvo, the uh, young man who just passed away, unfortunately. And what's special about this <clears throat> is that they've hired a composer um, who will basically interview kids and get a feel for what Ben's life was, was about. 
and then hopefully put that to music and they're hope, hopeful to perform that in their spring concert 2013 also play at next year's graduation which I think is very nice. They are involved in some fundraising and though we don't like to specify certain programs in public, the board, but if anybody's interested in that fundraising, get in touch with me and I'll put you in, in touch with the right people. And I think that's going to be a fitting and moving tribute to an outstanding young man. Uh, along with some other good news, in your agenda packet, we have a teacher, Ross Cooper, from Low Lane, um, who's been invited, one of few people in the world, um, to attend a uh, special session with Google developers, and he's actually going to be traveling internationally uh, very soon. And if you recall, last year Ross was, was selected as an Apple Distinguished Educator, and certainly his credentials with Apple helped open some doors with Google. So again, our students are going to get the best of what's going on with Google Minds at this international two-day conference. Uh, Ross will be attending and provide the board to them affirms that tonight. Um, recently, uh, there's an interesting suit. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. But nonetheless, uh, the PSEA filed a federal special ed suit on behalf of uh, special ed students in Chester Upland School District. And you know, the, the point of contention was that um, basically Chester was paying almost double for special ed cost um, for charter and cyber charter schools and special ed. So I had our business department run the numbers, and I was just curious. Um, Chester, I think their, their, what they were getting in federal and state aid was about 13000 per student. They were paying out $28,000. Um, ours, I, I asked Jim Frank to run the numbers, and basically uh, we're taking in uh, in this district about $7,870 per special ed student. Uh, you, you, you add into that some regular ed cost. And when we compare that number, which is $7,870 to the $17,613 that we're paying, um, we're paying in excess of $9,000 more than what we take in through, through aid. I don't, again, I don't think that suit's going to go anywhere, but it's an interesting dynamic. And I think, uh, at least what I've been seeing and hearing almost daily, daily, daily reports, I think the whole issue, not so much for bricks and mortar uh, charter schools, but certainly the cyber charter school is really a heated up topic. And I think almost every day I read something where it's testimony before some legislative committee. And um, what I was very happy is that last week, um, the Education Committee heard from the Auditor General about its concerns. And again, I want to remind everyone that it's been 10 years since cyber charter schools have come in to being, um, and it's time for the legislature to look at how they are funded. Um, along with that, there's people who ask me all the time about state funding, what's going on. I think one of the best letters that I've seen is something that came out of the Pennsylvania School Funding Campaign. This is an organization, 30, I think it's 39 different organizations who get together. It's an interesting letter sent to the uh, legislature and the governor about um, what they feel are um, deficits in the governor's budget. So it's there for you to read. I think it clarifies some of the things that we've been talking about publicly. And again, uh, this isn't written on behalf of one particular organization like Pennsylvania School Boards or PSEA or even PASA. This is a, all the agencies are listed on the back that have endorsed this letter. So again, I, I really feel that what's been going on, you know, at least in the last month and a half since the governor revealed his budget, is that there's a lot of concern statewide, not only local here, but all over the state and in different areas um, about the governor's proposal. So hopefully there'll be some political pressure to address some of the issues. Um, today, uh, we had an exceptional day. 
We have our second instructional rounds, uh, observation, visit, whatever we want to call it. We have 40 individuals from this district comprised of teachers and administrators. Um, we worked in teams of four again, and we visited um, over 30 high school classes. So you take four people, an hour of observations, we actually got 40 hours of observ observation. And certainly want to thank Dr. Toner and the people from our leadership team. This is McCarrick, Dr. McCarrick's here, or Dr. Tabi McCarrick is here. This is Campbell's here, Dr. Tabi, I like that. Um, and our leadership team has put together, Mrs. Nowak, a lot of work behind the scenes. And I thought today was another exceptional day. As we move closer to clearly defining what problem solving should look like in the East Penn School District, I'm reminded that this is a professional exercise that looks at our instructional core and is certainly aligned to our mission statement and vision statement. And so um, we're going to end the year with one more presentation. We're going to be doing a, a middle school sometime in April. And I think uh, the comments around the room were much like we, we heard and felt at Lincoln that people thought it was a well worthwhile professional experience to get to the classrooms. And again, um, we know critique teachers are very focused on their observation. And we look at what the teacher's doing, kids are doing, what the task is at hand. And uh, we do not make judgments not make evaluations. We only record observations and then we still debrief and look for patterns afterwards. Um, I'm happy to report that our middle school students did exceptionally well in the PJAS Regional Science Fair that took place on Saturday um, last month, Saturday the 25th last, last month at Easton High School Middle School. And thank Mr. Dorado for providing me the results. And this year, Lower McCunchy Middle School, we had 80 students that qualified for the regionals. Um, 50 first place winners. To give you an idea of how much we improved last year, we had 26 first place winners at Lower McCunchy Middle School. 27 second place winners, 24 last year. Three third place finishers this year, one third place last year and 16 special awards for our students. And IR, uh, the results were almost as good. We had 61 students who qualified for the regionals, 44 first place finishes this year, 42 last year, um, 16 second place this year, 22 last year, and both years we had one third place, and again, uh, 16 special awards. So we want to thank uh, the teachers who are involved in this and certainly congratulate our students. They now will be competing in the state uh, science fairs that will be held May 13th through 15th um, in State College. So good luck to our students. I um, also want to remind the board that uh, last week I had an interesting presentation served on a uh, panel discussion at Northampton Area Community College with about 75 senior citizens uh, regarding senior citizens and taxes. Um, I appeared with Bruce Davis, uh, local radio announcer, if you read the morning call, lots of times he has editorial pieces. So, um, got a very positive response and uh, had a good time. And interestingly enough, it, just a sign that both people aged. I was sitting looking at someone in the audience who looked vaguely familiar. I didn't realize he had a beard and his hair grew white. Here, Gil Green been one of my board members in Phillipsburg. I'm not a superintendent here, but you know, 18 years is a long time both age, but um, so it was nice basically coming home. Gil uh, retired from the Pollock where he was a, an executive and now moved to Pennsylvania where taxes are a little lighter than learning in New Jersey. So we had a nice discussion. Good to see Gil. He was, in my opinion, a superb board member when we had the opportunity to work with him in Phillipsburg. Uh, his son is, uh, was a scholar athlete at Phillipsburg High School. is now a superintendent in New Jersey, so it's great catching up with with Bruce. Tomorrow uh, we have our Senior Citizens Committee a meeting at 10 o'clock. The boys is ready and we're set to go. Yep. Um, we have a nice agenda. Uh, we've invited Mr. Davis. He'll be here I think uh, 
Uh, by the way, Mr. Davis is a Lower Mekonji uh, Township President. And, uh, so we're excited that he's learning more about the community. And um, last, a couple weeks ago, I talked about all the wonderful things our kids are doing in the community and some of the more innovative things we're doing. We put together a little booklet, which we're now going to share with seniors tomorrow. We're going to put in libraries and send it out to town, um, town governmental centers, but also when we meet with our real estate agents, and we'll be doing that sometime in April. In April, remember last year we started our first real estate program. We're going to come back and talk to our real estate agents uh, sometime in April. So we have a nice little book, and you know, especially when people are thinking about moving to our district, they see the nice things that we're we're doing for our community and the kind of exceptional things we're doing, um, innovative-wise, for our school district. Um, I'm looking at this. I think it's in my report, Mr. Bauer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seidenberger. Are there any questions for Dr. Seidenberger on this report? All right. Uh, well, then <coughs> let's move on to item two, personnel. Uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. <coughs> okay. Is there uh, any discussion of uh, personnel items? I'm appearing in this person, will you call a roll, please? Mr. Earnshaw. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Sanchez. Aye. Ms. Fuller. Aye. Mr. Policano. Aye. Mr. Bonker. Aye. Mr. Rocker. Aye. Mr. Stoltz. Aye. <coughs> Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Aye. Okay. Facilities. Uh, we have a number of engineering services items here. Is there any objection to moving them all together? Let's separate out number two, please. All right, so I guess we could, uh, is it one and three all right? So moved. Second. Okay, we're talking about items one and three. Are there any discussions on those items? Ms. Hyde? Just a quick question. Um, where are you going to put the uh, utility shed? They're, they are storage buildings. Okay, they're storage buildings, so that's why we have plans for literally building instead of the... On a slab, with walls, uh, electric uh, to the area to provide some kind of heat so that we won't have damage to whatever equipment we store in the building. Where is it going to be located? Uh, on the side of Jefferson. Jefferson, okay. And in the, back, in the back parking lot area of the high school. Thank you. Near the near the auxiliary gym, okay. outside the auxiliary gym. Yeah. Ms. Sanchez. We know about how many square feet of each one. Uh, we are going to be discussing that through the design process, but it should be between 15 by 15 or 20 by 20, depending on the, the space and the restrictions of the space. Any other questions? Ms. Virtual, will you call a roll, please? Mr. Stoltz. Aye. Ms. Hyde. Aye. Mr. Earnshaw. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Ms. Donchez. Aye. Ms. Fuller. Aye. Mr. Walker. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Okay, then we will have uh, item number two separated out. Uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Mr. Earnshaw. Yeah, I submitted this question uh, by email on page two of the, well, section one dash two of the agreement, which is the second page of it. Uh, it looks like from the footer, this was issued on March 16th. Uh, under the heading schedule in the second paragraph, it says, assuming this proposal is accepted by the East Penn School District no later than February 26th, and tech proposes to meet the schedule. Was that a typo that meant March? That was, a, that was a typo, and it should have been March. Okay, so we have already, you know, they agreed. We, we did that with them this morning, and they said absolutely it was a typo, and March is the correct date. Okay, thank you. Okay, now Mr. Hopper. I just want to kind of comment. They do have the, the starting mile, first milestone is March 27th, foster rotation to proceed. So there's some internal consistency pointing to a typo. Any other questions? Ms. Virgil, will you call a roll, please? Uh, I have a question. Oh. Yes. Hi. 
real quick question, I, and I know um, Mr. Glanty and I were talking about this, the $22,650 is going to come out of our 2011 um, or 12 capital reserve? Capital. Capital, thank capital. you. Okay. <laughs> And then the additional that I see that we have on our capital project schedule that will come out in 2012-2013. I mean, the work will be done in that school year. Okay. Uh, the capital projects roll forward until we've depleted the funds. So we spend it in a school year, but it's not really, besides having it budgeted for those projects in that it year, might, right. okay. then whatever's left rolls over to the next Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are proceeds from bonds, correct? That are that must be dedicated to capital projects. But it's not the capital reserve. That's a different account. And the paving projects and the water heater project can all the other projects and just speak at the max. I'm sorry. <coughs> the the paving projects and the hot water uh, heating project that was approved last month come out of the capital reserve. All the other projects come out of the capital. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Birchall, you call roll, please. Mr. Rhodes. Aye. Mr. Ernshaw. Aye. Ms. Donches. Aye. Ms. Fuller. Aye. Mr. Policano. Aye. Mr. Bocker. Aye. Mr. Stoltz. Aye. Ms. Hyde. Aye. Mr. Bell. Aye. Can I know it? Oh, where do I begin again? Legislative. It's a silly season with the budget. And uh, we still haven't got any good feel for what's happening with the budget. There have been no proposals firmly made by the Appropriations Committee, although they're having hearings. We hope to hear something soon, because they have to have some kind of stopping horse to uh, begin to discuss possible issues. But uh, right now, it's sort of very, very silent, which makes you wonder what's happening. But nothing would happen behind closed doors in our legislature, never. We won't go there. Um, right now, there are several bills in the Senate that are kind of interesting. I don't know how far they're going to get, but they're out there. Uh, there is a bill to change right to no provisions. We don't know yet what all is going to be in there, but they're having discussions on that. Uh, they're having discussions on a bill to um, change superintendent contract terms by some fiat of the legislature. Uh, mostly this has to do with angst about the buyouts that have occurred in uh, several large cities, including Allentown recently, and legislators' uh, righteous anger about the, uh, the buyouts. So uh, I don't know how far that's going either. Um, there is a bill that's of great interest to all school districts, and that's the special education funding bill, trying to come up with a new and adequate formula for special education funding. And it's all to our interest to let our legislators know about the discrepancies such as the fact that Dr. Seidenberger alluded to that local taxpayers are subsidizing uh, special education uh, in other schools, especially cyber charter schools uh, in the area, and they don't have the same degree of control over their tax money as they do if it's in a public school. Um, They've had a lot of uh, tries to, by even newspaper organizations, for instance, to get records out of these cyber charter schools. And they've been met with lawsuits trying to prevent them from getting the records. So you can't just walk up to a, a cyber charter school and try to find out how they spent the money like you can in a uh, public school. And uh, in East Penn, uh, upwards of $10,000 per child in special education is going to these schools of local money, not state money. Uh, Mr. Earnshaw. Yeah, well, I, actually, Mr. Ballard, I think what it is, it's the management companies that the charter schools hire. So the charter schools are quite open with their books. They say, we paid $8 million to this management firm. It's the management firm whose details they can't get at, I think, if I remember correctly. Well, that's part of it. The cyber charter schools are generally the, they are not run by a management company. They're run by a company that's running a cyber school. You can't get the information out of them either. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, special education funding and uh, funding of uh, cyber and charter schools is a big issue that you should keep on top of with your legislators. Um, 
the House has been relatively quiet. However, there is a bill, House Bill 855, talking about economic furloughs. You remember they were promising school boards that flexibility last year, and somehow that didn't occur. Uh, that's uh, for the taxpayers' understanding. Current school code prohibits uh, furloughing teachers solely for economic reasons. That's black letter statutory law, cannot be done. And uh, the legislature needs to change that so that like any other business, uh, we can address economic uncertainties with the possibility of uh, furloughs for economic reasons. And um, that's being currently discussed again in House Bill 855. So if you have uh, a favorable opinion on that bill, I suggest you talk to your legislators about that. And then another interesting set of bills. There are now two potentially competing bills. I don't believe both of them have been introduced yet. Purporting to try to address, from two different, widely different angles, property tax relief. One of the bills that's been most discussed has um, the county deciding whether or not to hold a referendum to replace, I believe, with a sales tax, a county sales tax, uh, <coughs> a certain percentage of the property tax in the county school districts with revenue from a sales tax. And uh, there would also be an uh, option to for the school districts to enact either an earned income tax or a personal income tax. And those are two different, widely different things in Pennsylvania for also reducing property tax. Um, and that's one bill that's been introduced, <coughs> or is purportedly going to be introduced. <coughs> this week, I came across another report of a bill that attempts to do a similar thing from the state level by increasing the state sales tax. Uh, this is almost like Sam Rohrer's proposal, and reducing the number of things that are exempt from state sales tax, uh, leaving food and uh, clothing under $50, for whatever purpose that is, uh, as the uh, sales tax exemption, and raising the state income tax. And this is, and uh, by rolling in that, and the sales tax, the income tax, and all the gambling money into the <coughs> mix, they were able to come up with almost $8 billion of the $9 billion of current property tax allocations in the state that would be funded through this mechanism. Now remember, that's going to have the state doling out money to school districts, <coughs> so it's not clear how somebody in a district like East Penn is going to fare on a state basis when they give us back the money, quote unquote. But that's, that, that is uh, all the devil in the details. But the other interesting thing is, is that they would not totally eliminate property tax either by this bill. The kicker in this was that because there's a gap of one billion dollars between what they could get with that revenue and what they could uh, be expending in property taxes, they said that that $1 billion represents the building costs that schools have currently on the books in terms of bonds. And that you would be able to keep a small property tax for the purpose of paying off these bonds. But they didn't say how you would finance construction, at least in what I read, in the future. So it's not clear whether this would simply be a mechanism you would continually be able to have a property tax to fund construction, or whether it would be something else, and whether or not you'd have to go to referendum for construction like some states, or you know, none of the details are out. But there are talk uh, about these two bills in the legislature right now, and um, one of them is reported to have 25 sponsors, the other is reported to have 30, they're coming from different coalitions. Uh, it's not clear if any of them are going to even get to committee or uh, be discussed, uh, but uh, they're out there. Uh, the perennial promise of fixing the property tax mess in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, but again, with the budget and some other things like that, I uh, have my doubts that anything's going to be discussed uh, in those areas, but I bring them to your attention so you know that they're, they're out there. 
Are there any questions about the legislature? It, it always, thank you, Mr. Ballard, it always concerns me when I hear them talk about replacing the property tax with something else. I, I took a look at the 2009-10 school year funding sources as published by the Department of Education. That's the last year that they published at this point. Uh, right now, East Penn, on state funding on a per dollars per pupil basis, looking at our average daily membership, we were 462nd out of 500 school districts. So there were only 38 districts that received fewer dollars per student than we did. So the, the concern, of course, is how would they propose to come up with a funding formula that would make sense in any in any sense of the word? I mean, it goes from a low of $1,830 in Derry Township out in Dauphin County all the way up to a high of almost $14,000 in Duquesne City, which is on the, the verge of being dissolved through insolvency, in spite of getting almost $14,000 per student. Uh, the next one is about 11500 We In a 09-10 school year, we got $2,626 per student. So you can see there's a huge range of, of amounts. And the, med the median in the state was $5,252, almost to the penny double what we got per student. That was the median. I did a little back of the envelope map. If we were to get just the median in state funding, we'd immediately be able to cut our property taxes by almost $22 million, just by getting the state average, not above average, just average, uh, which of course, what I did the math, it's about a 13 mil reduction in our property taxes, or about almost 30%. So if you, you want to talk about inequitable funding, I think here's uh, exhibit A for the defense. Well, that goes along with the uh, the understanding that we only get uh, about 18% of our budget from the state, and the rest is all local taxpayers' effort. Um, that's another story. Are there any other questions? Hmm. Mr. Stoltz. The second proposal you talked about is uh, Representative Cox, 1776, correct? Mm -hmm. Who's the prime sponsor and what's the bill number for the first proposal? Uh, I don't know. I don't have that written down here. I'm guessing that. Yeah. I think it's HB 2330. Prime Senator. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I think it's hitting that information when you can. I, I'll wander over there and ask me about that. Okay. Uh, like I said, the two proposals have just sort of come out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh, um, just, Jim's been working on that second one for a while. He basically took Sam Roar's legislation when Sam moved on and punched up. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going on to uh, business operations. Dr. Seidenberger had a comment. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize to the board. I, I missed some of my notes. Uh, we have a budget um, booklet update for you. We're going to pass out. I'm sorry, Mrs. Ms. Birdsell, I forgot about that. Um, I didn't see Debbie's face out in the audience tonight. So um, let me explain what we have for you. Um, this is the latest. Uh, we just finalized this. Uh, late last week. Uh, this takes into account uh, the allowable amount for exceptions and um, I always say this with the provision, these numbers will change most likely downward. We don't see a lot of new requests coming in. And just let me highlight um, some of the changes. Uh, unlike last, unlike last couple of years, we really took a look at our revenues, and I think we agreed that we could be a little more. Uh, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but I think we've been um, very concerned about certain levels of taxes coming in. I think next year we see enough evidence that we can be a little more optimistic without being risky. So we've. Uh, upgraded our revenue expectations. At the same time, I'm not going to use the word cuts, because I don't know if that's that's accurate, but we've adjusted our appropriations by about a million dollars downward. And we've looked at some things we haven't looked at traditionally. Um, for instance, in the area of benefit packages, uh, we've done an employee audit. and also looking at people who get retirement benefits. <clears throat> and there's some differentials in, in combination of packages and people 
leaving the system who are age 65, and the good news is that's it's about $240,000 differential this year. So we were able to uh, to lower that amount. Also, we've taken a, a long look at, at tuition reimbursements. Um, as you know, in our contract, we reimburse <coughs> staff members for courses that they take at a certain level. Um, you know, there's good and bad news in this. Uh, we've looked at the patterns, and the patterns are clear. We've, we've, even though we have a young staff, the numbers have gone down. And you may ask why. Well, the answers are very clear. Um, online courses are cheaper. And a lot of our staff members have opted to take um, online courses. Now, I want to remind the board that those schools are credited. And we do make them go through the procedures like anything else. They send their proposal to me. It's got to meet the guidelines that specified in the contract. Uh, but for some reason, uh, we've, we've taken a look at that. That's some area we haven't looked at. And so we're able to make substantial reductions in those categories. Also, uh, we found some creative ways to look at special ed expenditures. And I know you're looking at me. This is big And uh, we made some adjustments in that area. There, we got some good news on federal access money that we've been we've had a good collection rate and some of the things that we're spending we can move over and use federal funds to um, cover some of our local expenses. So we've we've tried to be a little creative this year and as you know um, class sizes are high. Um, so the chances to really cut back on staff are, are not as pronounced as they were last year. The other thing, we just simply, uh, now I'm looking at Mrs. Killer, we simply haven't had much information on retirements this year. Uh, very few, if any. They seem to be in the non-certificated staff area as opposed to professional staff. We've heard some rumors, but uh, I don't even know if we're going to get to 10 retirements this year. I, I, I don't think so. I, and I had a meeting last week with the association, and I think they affirmed that, that we're not sensing any great movement of people. So the opportunity for salary differentials is going to be uh, minimal this year. Um, long term, and certainly not something that we're ready to do this year, but uh, give you a little bit of, uh, of where my thinking is for 2013-2014 already. Um, two of the areas I think we're going to have to take a long, hard look at, and both of these areas are, are concepts that need time, and we certainly don't have that right now, but um, unless something is done with this governor's block grant and somehow transportation gets pulled out of that, I think we're going to have to look at transportation. I've already asked Mr. Glancy to contact Central Bucks, and he's done that. We're certainly going to be talking to some of the folks down there. If you know anything about Central Bucks, they uh, basically defunded a lot of transportation about last year or year before, and they were able to do that in working with partnerships with PennDOT. And that's a little extreme, but unless we see some movement on this block grants, you know, we're going to have to look at that. Now, this is a, a buzz of conversation among superintendents. You can read it in the paper. A lot of school districts are going to look at transportation. Um, and I think the other thing we're going to look at, we just talked about this briefly. Um, ever since I've come to the district, we've had a student package information system. Uh, next year may be the time that we want to take a look at our student information package. Um, it's rather expensive, it does a nice job, but the question we have to propose is, is there something that will do the work that we're doing now um, at a much reduced rate? The answer to that question is I don't know, but I do know this from professional experience. It's going to take about a year uh, to look at, at that. We're talking about East School Plus, our student information package. Is that the one that um, kindergarten on it? Yeah. Ms. Donches, could you address the, the chair when you want to ask a question, please? My apologies. Well, if you're ready for questions, you can go ahead. I, I, I am. Okay. Go ahead and ask that. Yeah. I was just verifying that I understood what the um, package is. Yeah, C-School Plus, Sunguard Penovation. And we've been, uh, We've been climbing there, so I don't, I don't know exactly the last time the board looked at this, but it's been five or six years, and it's probably in our best interest to take a look next year. Not promising, but um, I think we ought to take a professional look at student information packages. That 
manages attendance on a daily basis, that manages our high school scheduling program, our parental access program, uh, discipline, all those, uh, all those elements of student information that we, we need to keep on file uh, for a period of time specified by the state now. Okay. Um, before we go on, Dr. Seidenberger, I'd like to make sure that I understand uh, this budget package. Yes, sir. So would I be correct in saying that this is the first cut at the budget uh, utilizing currently all of the exceptions that we're entitled to as indicated as a tax increase yes. in this budget. And but we've made almost two million dollars adjustments since you've seen the preliminary budget. That's the other thing I want to stress to you tonight. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't affect the numbers for the millage in here yet. No, not yet, but it well, could be yes. Okay, I just want to make sure that we understand that this is not anywhere near to be the proposed final budget which we have to pass in May. This is just the first cut and showing you the rough numbers of where we would stand, <coughs> both with a tax increase of maximum possible under the Act 1, which includes exceptions, and without all of the cuts yet that Dr. Seidenberger is looking at. And just to also remind you, remember that last year's budget was the first year in the history of East Penn where year to year we spent less than we had the previous year. So understand that in the context of this budget. Okay, now are there other questions for Dr. Seidenberger? Mr. Bobber. Uh, for city revenues, what assumptions are made? Are you basically assuming that the government's uh, uh, I think, budget becomes law? Well, we readjust we readjusted downward a little bit. We were, uh, I think, in a ballpark with we'll, we'll, what we thought we would get. That's two years in a row. I think we were just about spot on. We reduced it about forty thousand um, dollars. I think it's too early to say. I mean, my comments about half an hour ago. Um, I'm a little more optimistic this year in some movements with cyber charter school payments, not bricks and mortar charter school, but cyber charter schools. So, but we can't anticipate that. But if we get anything in that regard, it's going to certainly be good news. Let's say the state. The number I've heard floating around is like. $3,000 differential between um, what tuition rates are and what actual expenses are. So for us, 3,000 kids times 111 kids, is a lot of money. Okay, are there any other questions? I'll just point out, this is, again, this is a preliminary. But the next presentation, they will be rolling out a series of adjustments to this getting closer and closer to the final budget. As you look at this, you can look for cuts, you can look for uh, class sizes, uh, any other effects that you want to understand about the budget and have those questions based on this preliminary material after you hear what the adjustments are. And anything I talked about orally tonight, we're going to give you in, in almost like a written report next board meeting, like we did last year. We made adjustments in revenues, we'll show that. And those places where we've made adjustments and appropriations, we'll show you that too. And this book is very similarly laid out to the final budget book that you can, if you already <coughs> have a copy, you can get a copy from Ms. Birdsell. Um, they're also available in, in public spots as well, just for comparison purposes. But remember, this is not even a proposed preliminary budget. This is just a first swag at all of the parameters which is including currently the governor's budget proposal. We don't know whether that's going to be the same thing when we come up in May and June. It also includes the maximum possible tax increase, not the real tax increase or any uh, thing approaching what it may be, uh, because it is not real yet. This is just the preliminary numbers to give you a basis to start asking your questions. So please take that into account. Uh, shouldn't be going out and telling people that we're going to raise taxes this amount or whatever. This is just the what we could do if nothing else changed, if we didn't cut anything. This is what the, the administration is proposing as a first cut for this. They will come back with other suggestions of cuts. It will always be lower, but this is where you start. So that the next meeting is when we will start to get into the heavy duty budget 
analysis and heavy duty consideration of what we want to do. And um, I believe currently, Mr. Glancy, the transportation budget is like $1.8 million. For, <coughs> for pay? Yes. Higher than that? Higher than It's over three, isn't it? Well, public and non public can. <coughs> it's split. Okay. So uh, we haven't proposed cutting that either. We're just talking about the potential for impact. Studying it, addressing it a year from now. A year from now. Okay, so that's. So let people important. know that this is, unless we see movement on this block grant, we're very concerned about, about how transportation is being funded. Okay, and the, and the reason for that is they're trying to hide, hide everything in one basket and tell you that they're making increases in the basket, but they forgot to tell you that not all the components of the basket are increasing. So what you end up with is they can cut and say, oh, you have flexibility. Now you can assign transportation funds to education because you didn't get them for educational purposes, basic education subsidy. It doesn't work that way. Transportation is a fixed cost. It's so much per pupil per mile that it occurs. So they're, they're playing uh, hide the pig in the poke and you can't even squeeze the bag. Mr. Bocker. I had a question about the transportation costs. I understand we're required to uh, provide transportation and not to non-public students within certain boundaries, certain distance from that. That's correct. Um, does any of that change if we cut, is that dependent on us having transportation to our students or our own students? students? Yes. We still have to provide those if we don't provide, provide no, if we do not provide transportation to our own students, we don't have to provide it. it to anyone else. Like Allentown doesn't. Mm -hmm. Except so special, 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 special education. education. Right. So the state could potentially be forcing... Well, like I said, we're, this is a hot topic among superintendents, and we, we have a lot of respect for Central Bucks. Uh, the school district, not without means, by the way, but I think if we looked at Probably Mr. Inshaw, they'll probably be in that group of what us, most you know, districts getting state aid. Um, this is what happens. And it's actually not guaranteed that we're advised to do that, transport kids, but it's one of those unfunded mandates. And unfortunately, you know, something I don't want to do this year, but things don't change, we're going to have to look at next year. Talk about it. Talk about a hot topic. It's not exactly an unfunded mandate. Right. Uh, to, it, it is a right. non-mandated service under the current school code. There are very few things that are not mandated under the school code, and transportation is one of them, except for special education students. And the other questions, Mr. Earnshaw. Just, just for point of reference, on uh, section four, page two, I found the line item for student transportation for the current year's budget at $6.45 million, and that includes public schools, charter schools, non-public schools, special ed, that's everything with the, the initial pass of the budget is 6.77. So, yeah, it's a substantial portion of our budget. Of course, there's, there are lots of benefits to having that available. We, we get a lot of traffic off the roads. So there's less environmental impact. There's a, certainly a convenience factor. There's congestion at the schools. There are a lot of benefits by having public transportation. So this is something we'll have to definitely go slow on as we discuss the pros and cons. But I mean, that's the kind of hard decisions you may have to make as we approach <coughs> things when you talk about what cuts we can make to lower the budgetary impact. That's the kind of thing we have to talk about in the millions of dollars. At $6 million, it's less than 5% of our total budget. So you're into those kind of numbers. No other questions? All right, we'll go on to the approval of the bill list. Is there any objection to moving items one through five together? Mr. Stoltz. I have a question on item number one, so I ask that we take that separately. All right, uh, let's try item number one then. So moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion on number one? Mr. Stoltz. Uh, yes, I just uh, asking for an explanation on the little addendum to this we got. Um, before the meeting. PSBA Insurance Trust, other professional services, $4,164. What is that? Why are we paying for it? I likely will prove it. I just would like to know. Mr. 
Vocational and adult education is visiting the campus for uh, half a day at LCTI and then half a day at LTRI-C. So that, that's a great recognition of the programs we have there. I'm sure we'll hear more about it after the fact. Also on Thursday of this week at uh, 10 o'clock at LTRI-C is a press conference detailing uh, as part of the signing of the articulation agreement with Bloomsburg on the Bachelor of Applied Science degree that's being offered in conjunction with LCTI, LTRI-C, and Bloomsburg. This allows high school students who get credits for the work they've done at LCTI, they get college credits, assuming they pass their certification exams, they can then apply those, transfer those to LTRI-C, take a series of classes at LTRI-C with some online courses from Bloomsburg, and in a total of three years and an investment of about $20,000 get a Bachelor of Applied Science issued by Bloomsburg without actually having to travel to or live in Bloomsburg. They'll be able to continue to live here, work here if that's their choice. So it's a phenomenal program. It's the first of its kind in the state and we expect that this will lead to additional programs being introduced in other parts of the state. <coughs> so uh, great, great uh, things are happening there and some real great opportunities for our students. Since we're getting to the point where we're going to be sending off one of our daughters to college in a year and a half, looking at the potential cost, a bachelor's degree for 20 grand 
seems like a bargain. No, beyond a bargain, it's a steal. <laughs> I think you have a child of Princeton, Mr. Fisher. Oh, yeah, move. <laughs> <laughs> that, that covers, that covers <laughs> part of the first semester. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe, first. maybe the food bill. Maybe you pay me more. So, thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Earnshaw. And uh, thank you for the economics lesson on college. <laughs> Are there any? Uh, Ms. Sanchez. <laughs> Yes, I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Seidenberger and Mr. Glancy for accommodating my request for the detailed budget of the 2011. Mrs. Sertable. And Mrs. Sertable, I'm sorry, she's not here, so. Yes, um, I very much appreciate. I've been um, coming to meetings, as you know, a couple of years, and I was always curious about the detail and actually not having as much detail as I would have liked. And I think by having it that I will be able to ask better questions, I'll be better informed, I'll understand the budget better, and I just uh, appreciate transparency, and I wanted to say thank you very much. Okay, Mrs. Sanchez, that's fine. Uh, just remember with 3,899 items, uh, we can't afford a minute of a piece to look at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not unless we want a 64 hour meeting. Uh, once I was introduced to the chart of accounts, you know, I became very intrigued with that. I can see the explanation there, so we don't have to explain it. Fine. Are there any other new business? Uh, prior to this meeting, we had a clear session to discuss real estate, litigation, and that's it. Real estate, litigation. And uh, we have the following announcements. Uh, the week of March 26th is kindergarten registration. We urge everybody to get registered as soon as possible so we know how many people are coming in this year. It helps us do a lot of planning and it's very important for the budget process if we know how many people are coming in for the, next, for the fall season. Uh, please help us out. Uh, urge your neighbors with kindergarten age children who are going to be attending East Penn to come out and register. You can see our website for further information. Uh, March 29th, 30th, and 31st, there will be the Irish Spring Musical, Annie Jr., uh, with a matinee on the 31st at 2 p.m. Uh, the same dates, the uh, LMMS Spring Musical, The Boys from Syracuse, also with a matinee on the 31st. Uh, April 5th, 6th, and 9th will be Spring Break. April 23rd will be our next board meeting. And with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.